Alright, welcome everybody. Um, today I'm going to be talking about my TFT EBS system, EBS encoder, decoder. Well, it's not even a coder. It's not even a, a coder, really. It's a receiver generator, I guess you could say. It's a C2 tone generator, and you, this is called a tone decoder. Um, however, there's no code to it, really. It's just a tone. Anyways, what is this? Well, a lot of people in the EAS community are familiar with these things. This is one of the most common, uh, or was at one time, one of the most common emergency alert system uh, units that, that's ever been on the market, I would say. It's probably one of the most famous, really, in the U U.S. market, which is the only place where the EAS system lives. Um, now... The EBS system was actually the system before the EAS system. So it was called the Emergency Broadcast System. Um, and it was basically created for the same purpose while we have it now, um, to mass notify people of an emergency. And uh, it carried uh, its information via FM radio or television broadcast, um, given the name, Emergency Broadcast System. And uh, all it did was played uh, a combination of tones um, before the uh, alert audio um, well we call it alert audio now but ne back then it was just a message and we called it just a message um, so basically in a radio station um, I'm not gonna tell you how it was hooked up in a in a broadcast station because that's different but I have experience with the radio side of things so I'll go over a radio install um, basically you would have, as you can see here, there's three modules in it. There's a two-tone generator, there is a FM receiver, and a tone decoder. The EBS tone, okay, consists of these two tones, 853 hertz, 960 hertz. Same as the EBS tone that we use on, that these uh, EAS encoders generate. Um, and basically, you know, you would receive via a phone call, via whatever, uh, news feed, whatever happened, however you would get the notification of the alert, besides another station, so like if you were originating a station, the, I mean an alert, the National Weather Service would call you, tell you that there's a tornado for this area and there needs to be an alert sent. After doing all the checklist stuff and whatnot, you would go on the air, you say, we interrupt normal pro, pro or we interrupt your normal program for this emergency message and then or, I'm sorry then they'd be like please stand by for the EBS tone that would play for however long it's actually quite a long time um, and I guess the reason why it was such a long time was just so that way yep there it is and they'd be like the National Weather Service has issued an emergency uh, has issued a tornado warning for this area blah 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 anyways and the only information that was ever carried was just that tone and then we have our tone decoder here um, this would be listening to another radio station and the other radio station would have this in operate mode um, and the, whenever it hears the tones it will set off an alarm or whatever and uh, the jock that's currently in the station would hear the tones I mean would hear the alert write down the information uh, maybe they might even have an automated recording system with a reel-to-reel -reel player or something like that. They automatically recorded it, so if the jock uh, what, didn't get to it in time or didn't hear something, they could rewind it and hear it back real quick before re-broadcasting uh, it. Then they would write it down, and then they would do the same exact thing. You know, we interrupt your normal programming for this emergency message. Please stand by for the tone. Play the tone, and then give out the message information. And um, it, it would just go down the line like that. Now, if you notice, that's completely reliant on somebody being there. Um, so, that, that completely re requires somebody to be there. Well, this was made in the l mid to late... S this wasn't this wasn't made in the mid to late 70s, but the, the EBS system, I can't remember the exact date that it was made, but it was made somewhere in the late 70s, I believe. Um, and this unit, I think, was designed in the very, very early 80s, maybe the late 70s even. I'm pretty sure it's the early 80s, though that this unit was designed. Um, this one's actually from the mid 80s, this this one right here. Um, it's like I said, it's from the mid 80s. So this is kind of right before 
or man, I'm sorry, this is from the late 80s. I think this one was made around 1988. And uh, this is pretty late for the EBS system. This was right before the EAS system came out, um, if I'm remembering correctly. So basically, around that time, the, the late 80s, early 90s, people started moving from actual jocks being in the studios, spinning records, playing reel-to-reel -reel tapes, carts, whatever. People moved from you know, having a, a person there and relying on that person to play the music to computers playing the music using things called automation systems. Well, when you have your entire radio system ob automated, except for your EAS, or I mean your EBS system automated, then, you know, you got problems. Because if you got to have somebody there just to listen for an EBS, then, you know, you can't do that. So, basically, what they did is they moved on from the EBS system and they made the EAS system, the emergency alert system, that used the same tone for an attention tone, not to actually trigger things, but as an attention tone to get somebody's attention because it's such a jarring tone. And then they used FSK, frequency shift keying, or audible frequency shift keying, AFSK, um, to actually uh, incorporate uh, the data into the alerts and automatic message recording. So that way, the EAS system could be, could be completely automated and you never have to worry about it. Unless, you know, somebody actually has to go in and send a test. And, and it wasn't always automated. People had it set up sometimes to have to be manually relayed or whatever. But for the most part, it was designed so that way you could have the ability to automate it. That's where the EBS system died. And uh, these units very quickly became thrown out. And, uh, I mean, they were a pain for people to incorporate into their systems. They were just, nobody liked them. And as far as what engineers have told me over... And uh, so they kind of got thrown out and forgotten about and they're a really cool piece of history and nobody seems to, can't find a lot of them. There's a couple of these exact ones on eBay of not in great condition and they go for as much as these, honestly. If you can ever find one of these on eBay, they don't pop up very often anymore. Um, but yeah, I'm very glad to have this. If I, unless I, I mean, I haven't seen every video on the internet, but as far as I can tell, this might be the first video on the EBS, on actual EBS equipment that isn't from like just a dot, like a, isn't from just like a videotape that's been converted to digital or whatever. I, I mean like, this is probably the first ever, as far as I know of, this is the first video on YouTube of a, an EBS unit from an EAS collector point of view, I guess. Um, there is a couple videos from like EBS training films that have been digitized over the years. But, but this is the only one that I've, this is, this I believe is the first one that's from a collector's point of view. So, like I said, you've got the two-tone generator here. You've got an FM receiver module. Mine does not work at the moment. And you also have a two-tone decoder. Now, this is quite interesting, the way this works. If you notice, there's a reset switch, a listen operate switch, and a speaker. Well, the idea here is actually quite interesting. Um, basically, instead of being in any sort of alarm state, you could either have this on listen, which would always have audio coming out the speaker, or operate mode, where it will only have audio coming out the speaker if it detects the tone. So if it was an operate mode, let's say, okay, basically this would be connected to the FM receiver module, so you would, if you flipped it to listen, you'd be hearing audio come out from another radio station. Mine isn't working at the moment, so that's why you don't hear that, but if it was, you would hear you know, another radio station's audio, and you don't want that always going on, so you flip that into operate mode, which means it basically mutes it unless it hears alert audio. Now on the back, there is a relay connection, uh, so that way when it does actually receive an alert, it, it clicks a latching relay, so there's a relay on the back that's latching, and, it, and it, it, you know, it's usually wired up to a beacon or something like that. Um, so yeah. And then the reset switch here, which my camera's not going to focus, okay. The reset switch there will actually uh, reset the alarm, so that way the beacon's no longer going off. Now, if you'll notice here on the two-tone generator, to set off the alarm, you have to flip these switches in opposite directions. Why not just have a single button or something like that? Well, back in the day, the FCC decided that it is too easy to set off an emergency broadcast if you just had a single button to push. So they made it mandatory for any EBS generator to require two, two actions or t 
two different, two separate actions to set something off. So in order for this to be approved by the FCC, they had to have two switches that had to be uh, not mistaken, not easily set off, you know, not easy to be set off. So basically if something were to fall and it flips them both down, right? Like, a, I don't know, this pliers or something were to fall or something, it couldn't set off the EBS unit. I mean, it still could if it like fell just right or something like that, but anyways. So, yeah, they that that's actually mentioned in the manual for this thing because on the back there's actually a remote input so you can trigger this thing remotely and set off in a EBS remotely um, now the reason why that's probably uh, there is because on a broadcast console they used to have a thing called start stop buttons now back in the day when you actually played your music off of CD players, cassette tapes, reel reels, whatever, they all all broadcast um, CD players, cassette tapes, whatever. They all had remote inputs, so they could be controlled from a you know they could be started, stopped, rewind, whatever from a remote area because they might be in a rack far away. Um, so on the boards, the broadcast consoles themselves, they actually had buttons to start and stop this equipment, and I'm gonna assume they probably. Uh, made that feature so that way you could have like a send EBS button or something on the actual uh, broadcast console itself. Back in the day there wasn't a lot of extra equipment you had to mess with. Most of your buttons and stuff could be wired into the broadcast console so everything you touch was on the broadcast console and it's just talking to other equipment. Now you'll notice there's also a reset slash test so if you set it off the reset basically just sets resets the timer and the alert relay on it because when you send an alert it clicks a relay so that way it can interrupt audio. And then there's a test switch, which sends out tones, but it doesn't actually click the alert relay. Now, the interesting thing with the EBS system is that unlike the EAS system, where it's designed to go at the very end of the air chain, so the EAS system is designed to sit right before your transmitter, maybe right before your processor. We usually set them right before the processor, but you could set it anywhere, really. Um, but they're meant to go in the final steps of your air chain right before the transmitter. And they would interrupt the audio instead of uh, just, you know, being added onto... Basically, what I'm trying to say is these would interrupt the audio, okay? So they would stop whatever audio is playing. No matter what happened, it would just stop it and then, you know, override and output its audio. These aren't designed to be like that. I mean, they, they could be wired up like that. They definitely have been in the past. It actually goes over in the manual how to wire them up like that. But mainly, it seems that they were mostly wired up as another input on your mixing console or your broadcast console. And uh, no audio ever made it into these other than the FM receiver. So instead of interrupting your air chain, these would be a part of your air, uh, part of your broadcast uh, chain, I guess, you could, your audio chain. Um, actually, not even a chain. It would be just one input on your broadcast console. So that way, because these never really had to interrupt anything, they could just be another input and send out a tone, and that's all it was. So anyways, these are really cool pieces of equipment, and uh, yeah, I've, uh, like I said, I believe this might be the first video about this on YouTube. I'm not 100% sure, but really cool piece of equipment, and heck, they could still receive EAS uh, alerts today, just not from the National Weather Service. Now, in the manual, it talks about two different versions of this tone decoder. There's one, just the regular tone decoder, and then there's one that they called, like, the advanced tone decoder or something like that. Um, it doesn't necessarily explain what that's for, but what I believe it is, is I believe that adds a 1050 hertz tone decoder in it as well. Uh, so that way you can actually detect National Weather Service. I think this was a much later add-on, uh, but anyways, um, I'm not really sure. I haven't seen that. Uh, on one of these yet, and uh, I, mine doesn't have it, so that kind of sucks, but I've got all these EAS units, and when they relay alerts, I don't actually have the National Weather Service monitor on, so they relay the alerts with the EBS tone, so that way, this will go off. Um, now, one thing I want to note real quick is a lot of my EAS stuff, I've actually gotten local to me because I work for a radio station, um, I've actually been able to get a lot of this stuff local and, and kind of have some, some parts of local radio history, which is really cool. And so one thing I want to note is, if you'll see here, it says WKQR EBS. This is from Mullins, West Virginia. Um, and one really cool thing about that is that 
I have the WKQR EAS index. So, I actually have <laughs> I have the first uh, emergency alerting history that we have, I guess, the, the first ever unit that they had, which is the EBS system. And I also have the uh, one of the later units when the EAS system came out and they got rid of this and they put this in. I've also got the EAS unit. Um, now, they now have a Sage Digital Index, and if those ever become obsolete, I'll probably get that one too, and I'll have all of them, I guess. That would be really cool. So, uh, anyways, I just wanted to show that I've actually got two of them from the same station, uh, uh, just, like, decades apart. So, well, really, just a decade apart. Um, anyways, pretty cool little history, and, uh, sorry if I've rambled on in this video. I, I didn't really have any, like, script or anything. I just wanted to start talking about them because they're cool. So, hopefully you enjoy. Thank you.